You know, one of the best things about the Christmas season are having children's pageants uh, in church, at school. I don't guess they do it as much in school as they used to. But uh, I read this week uh, one grandfather's account of a pageant that he went to at his grandson's school. And I'd like to read that to you. Uh, he said, uh, on Friday, I went to Cole's kindergarten presentation. After they finished singing all their Christmas songs, wearing their reindeer antlers, the teacher explained that the kids had been learning how to ask great questions during the year. And they were going to conclude by letting each kindergartner give one question they'd like to ask Santa. As they handed the microphone to each child, that's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> uh, here's what they said. One of them said, why do you live at the North Pole? Another one said, why do you come only once a year? <laughs> How do you make your list? Another one asked, and I think this is a good question, how did you meet Mrs. Claus? <laughs> Finally, they came to one little boy who took the microphone and stood there and looked for quite a long time, and then all of a sudden said, I like Batman, <laughs> and handed it off to the next one. They continued down the line, questions like, what is your favorite elf? What is your favorite day? And then one asked, what is your favorite cookie? And that set the tone, the next one, what is your favorite cookie? And the next one, what is your favorite cookie? And the next one, what is your favorite cookie? Until they came to the last one who said, what is your favorite beer? <laughs> so that's always fun. Uh, there was an article in the paper not too long, about, not too long ago about NFL teams some of them having to play on Christmas or Christmas Eve. And so they have to travel during the Christmas season. And they, it said in the article that they had to make preparation in advance so they won't miss Christmas. Missing Christmas. One of the, one of the players said there's no way he's going to miss Christmas. And I got to thinking uh, about that, that statement about missing Christmas. How could you possibly miss Christmas? Christmas. It's the most advertised holiday in the world. It's been commercialized. It's been anticipated. The whole month of December is devoted to Christmas. I think it would be pretty hard to miss Christmas. We have decorations. We have Christmas music playing in all of the stores. We put our cards in the mail. There are shows on TV. There are carolers, parties that we go to pageants we go to and we're bombarded by Christmas ads but it is still possible to miss Christmas the real reason for Christmas you can miss it uh, and you can miss it for the same reasons that a lot of people missed it most people missed it at the first Christmas why do so many people miss Christmas I think we can look at that Christmas story and see the reasons that they missed it, and it's still true for us today. So the first reason that people missed Christmas was their busyness. And that's illustrated by the innkeeper. He was so busy, he missed the coming of the Christ child. You know the story. We all know the story. She was in her last week of pregnancy. They had to go back to their hometown to register for the census that had been ordered by the Roman government. And so they had to go to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was full of other people who were coming to register for the census. And so when they got to the inn, there was no vacancy. All the rooms are taken, the innkeeper must have said. There's nothing available. No vacancy sign is posted. We don't have any rooms. They're all filled up. It says in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now for the innkeeper, when you think about it, this was a good thing. Business was booming. I mean, his place was full. That's what you want when you have a motel, isn't it? Every single room filled up. Turn on the sold out, no vacancy sign. For him, 
it had to have been great. This was a hugely busy time of the year and all of these travelers needed shelter. But he had no room for this baby and he had no idea who he was snubbing. The point is that his busyness caused him to miss the greatest opportunity that he would ever have in life. He had the opportunity to meet God and he missed it. He had the opportunity to be used by God and he missed it. He had the opportunity to be a part of history and he missed it. Can you imagine the PR uh, uh, value of being able to post a sign above your inn? The Son of God born here. You know, that would have drawn a lot of people. But he missed it. And so the question for us today is, are you too busy with all the things going around you to make room for Jesus? Is there no room in your schedule? I was just thinking, I mean, I already had this message prepared, and yet yesterday I was thinking, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I've got too many things to do. I've, there's too much going on around me, and I don't, I've got to preach this message Sunday, and I don't want to miss Christmas. I don't want to miss Christ in Christmas. That's what it's all about. It's not about the packages. It's not about the trees and the lights. It's not even about the kids up here singing for us. It's about Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Come to earth so that we can be saved. Uh, so we need to make room in our schedules, in our plans, our budgets. We need to make room in our thoughts. Psalm 10 verse 4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. You could be so busy that you miss meeting God at Christmas. The second reason a lot of people miss Christmas is familiarity. Now this is kind of strange, but it's shown by the religious leaders. You know, you could have celebrated Christmas every year, all of your life. You know all of the stories, you know the songs, you know the traditions. But we do it so much, some people can get jaded. It becomes too familiar. And so we, ha we get bored with it. We have a lack of enthusiasm about it. And it becomes Christmas, ho hum. It came around again this year. And not too interested. It can get so familiar uh, with something that it doesn't amaze you anymore. And you miss the beauty of it. You see it, but you don't do anything about it. This was the, re this was the mistake that the religious leaders of that day made. Last week we talked about the trip the wise men made and the lessons we could learn from their worship of, of God. Uh, and we learned that they came into Jerusalem and they went to the king, King Herod, and told him, we followed this star. Now their trip had been probably around two years. This is a long trip they made. And they're looking for the Christ child. And so they come to him and say, where's this baby that's been born a king? And he had no idea. So he calls all of the religious leaders together. It says in Matthew 2, verses 4 and 5, When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Now, many were familiar with this prophecy. All the religious leaders knew about this prophecy. They knew where Jesus would be born. They could quote the scripture, but they were quite unimpressed. They were bored with it all. They were unconcerned. They'd seen it all before. They were the religious leaders. This is astounding when you think about it. Just think about their position for a moment. Dignitaries had come into Jerusalem from a faraway country. People they'd never seen of or heard of before. They were dignitaries that went to the king went to King Herod and all of a sudden maybe in the middle of the night I don't know the king sends for them and shakes them out of bed and says we got to talk I need the answers to some questions and these guys are standing 
before the king in an emergency meeting. And they knew the answer to the question. But they, <clears throat> they did not care enough to check it out. They had the right answer, but they didn't do anything about it. They didn't even bother to go see for themselves. Is this king been born in Bethlehem? Uh, they would rather debate about the Savior than go see the Savior. And so many people are that way yet today. Do you ever stop to think, Bethlehem is only five miles from Jerusalem. Five miles. And yet they wouldn't walk that five miles that these wise men had walked for a couple of years. And they wouldn't walk those five miles to go to Bethlehem to see if it was true. They were jaded. Their lack of curiosity is absolutely stunning. For centuries they'd been waiting for a savior. For centuries they'd been debating about it, discussing it. For centuries they'd been studying, but they had no room in their theology for God to actually show up. They couldn't see that. They, did, they just didn't care enough. All kinds of traditions had been tacked onto their religion. Over time, they paid more attention to the traditions than they did to God. Sound familiar? So many traditions today. And people participate in almost all of the traditions. They decorate their houses. They eat the Christmas food. They go to the Christmas parties. They partake in all of that. And yet, no concern for why they're doing all of that. What is Christmas all about? And so, they're not concerned with what he came to do. They're not concerned with anything that is true and accurate. Oh, you can put up Christmas lights and still be in the dark. And so many are. Ephesians 4 verse 18 says, They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. They miss Christ in Christmas. The third reason that people miss Christmas is fear. And this is illustrated by Herod the king. It's a sad fact that some people in our society today are afraid of Christmas. And some of you might be going, what? Afraid of Christmas? Think about it. This is why they protest at having Christmas displays set up on public land. This is why they sue the government to get them taken down. They're afraid of what is going on. Herod was afraid. Herod had been appointed to be the king of the Jews. And Herod was not a Jew. And yet he was supposed to be their king. And Herod was a paranoid man. He thought that they were all out to get him. I heard it said one time that just because you think they're all out to get you doesn't mean they're not. <laughs> but that's what he thought. Everybody was out to get him. Everybody was after his throne, he thought. He thought it so strongly that he killed his own wife, lest she be able to take his throne. He had his own mother killed, lest she be able to come to his throne. This is, these are facts of history. The, uh, he also had his, uh, his brother-in-law and two of his sons murdered to keep them away from his throne. He was so concerned about uh, his own death and would people mourn for him, and he knew they would not, that he had a host of very prominent men that were assigned to be killed upon his death so that the city would be in mourning over these prominent men. You don't get any crazier than that. Uh, and that's the kind of man he was. So when the wise men show up to ask him about this child born a king, he went out of his mind. He went crazy. It says in Matthew 2, 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. It was stronger than that because his fear finally led him to kill every baby boy in Bethlehem who was two years old and younger. Two and younger, every baby boy. All because of his insanity 
his fear, his wanting to be on that throne. Fear keeps a lot of people from getting to know God. Fear, when in the early days of my own Christianity, it was one of my fears that I would lose my freedom, that I wouldn't have any fun in life anymore, that that's what Jesus was all about, taking all of that away. And it's so wrong because I've never, I never knew what life was really about until I came to Christ and began to serve Him. So fear keeps a lot of people from getting to know God. Herod's fear was the fear of losing control. He didn't want any king to be on that throne except himself, even after he was dead. So we arrive at the position then of how do we not miss Christmas? You know, when I was, uh, when I was a little boy, I'm sure a lot of you learned some of the same things that I learned. They taught me as a little boy, if you ever catch fire, what do you do? Thank you. Stop, drop, and roll. That's it. Okay? And as a child, I was also taught that when I cross the street, I have to stop, look, and listen. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to stop, look, and listen to learn how to not miss Christmas. The first one is stop. Stop filling my life with less important things. Don't let busyness keep you from knowing God. Don't let the pace of life in our world keep you from knowing God. We get into running the rat race. We get into wanting to climb the ladder of success and we run that rat race. But the problem is, even when you win the rat race, you're still a rat. Okay? So you, you just, uh, you're so busy uh, making a living that you miss a life. And so I suggest to you that because uh, that we need to beware of the barrenness of a busy life. You see, busyness will fill your schedule, but it will fracture your family. Uh, the greatest tragedy of life is that most are too busy to take time for God. So what's the antidote for that? Simply stop running and slow down. Stop and slow down. Uh, Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. You might say today, Chill out and know that I am God. Get still and know that He is there. Uh, it's interesting to me that the good news of Jesus was first given to the shepherds, people who were not too busy to listen. They're sitting out there on the hillside taking their time. They're in no hurry. They're not trying to climb the ladder. They're not running the race. But they're sitting on a hillside guarding sheep. And God said, those people will listen. They'll hear the word. And they did, of course. Uh, what else was there for them to do? The sheep were all asleep. And uh, so they could listen. If you don't have time to get to know God, then folks, you're too busy. Way too busy. It's the most important thing you can do in your life. Uh, Proverbs 10 verse 27, the fear of the Lord adds length to life. You want a, you want a long life? Live in fear of the Lord. And that doesn't mean you walk around all cowered down because of God. It means that you live a respectful life toward God. You respect Him. You fearfully respect Him. That's what that verse is about. And it will add to the length of your life. Uh, Whatever you need more of, you need more time, then give some time to God. And you'll get it. You need more money, give money to God. And you'll get it. Uh, anything that you need, if you give it to God, you'll get more. Uh, and so we've got to make room in our schedule. The, in, the innkeeper would have, would have to have displaced somebody to let the baby in. And you know what, folks? Sometimes in our lives, we have to displace something else in order to have time for God. We've got to give something up to get that kind of time. It's true for you as well as me. Whenever Jesus comes into your life, something else has to go for you to have that time. Uh, secondly, look, we stop 
and we look. Look closely at why Jesus came. Make the effort to check it out. Investigate Jesus. Look at the facts. Look at the evidence for Jesus Christ being God, being the Son of God. Who is He? What is He? Why does He matter? There's one good thing that Herod told the wise men. He said to them in verse 8, He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. Be open and honest in your search. Look for him. Find out whether or not it is true. I can say that very openly and very confidently because I've studied the evidence intently. And I know that with an open mind and an open heart, you cannot help but come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is real. Uh, so look closely at why He came. You know, these, uh, these wise men uh, made the effort to check out the Christ. They saw this star. I don't know exactly what it looked like. Did it look like a normal star? Was, I know it must have been brighter. The big thing about it is it was moving. Go check that out some night on a clear night and look up at the stars and see if you find any of them moving. Uh, you're not going to find it. One night a bunch of us were camping up north. A bunch of men from church were camping up north and we had one guy with us who had so much knowledge about what was going on up in the heavens. He got his watch out and he said, now you guys watch on that horizon. And he, and he said, in 10 minutes, he's counting down. You're going to see a star move all across the sky and settle down in that. So we're all sitting there going, what is this? And sure enough, here it came. Light came over the horizon, moved all across the sky and settled on the other side. It was a satellite. And he knew exactly the timing of that satellite. And he was just trying to frighten us with that. And it was a little scary when you think about it. So these guys saw a star that was moving. It wasn't a satellite, it was a star. It was God's star. And so they made the effort to follow that star. Don't you know that if that star is up there in the sky and it's brighter than normal and it's moving, don't you know other people saw it too? And only these guys, and we don't know how many by the way. I don't know if there were three or ten or a hundred. I don't know how many there were. But they, they were not the only ones to see that star. They apparently were the only ones to follow it to check it out, to see what was going on. Uh, others who were much closer missed it. Those in Jerusalem, those in Bethlehem itself. They all missed it, but these wise men checked it out and followed it. Don't be one of those who are going through all the traditions of Christmas with no curiosity about why. Check it out. Jeremiah 29, 13, one of the greatest promises in the Bible. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen. You can't miss God if you start looking for him. You can't miss him because he said, you will find me if you seek me out. God is saying, be a seeker. Check me out. Read the New Testament. I suggest to you, get the Bible and read the book of John first. It was written for a reason. And the reason it was written is so that people who are seeking can find God, can find Jesus. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles scattered all through here under the seat in front of you. Take one. Find a new one. Some of them are old and used. Find a new one and take it. Uh, we give it to you so that you can read your Bible. Please take advantage of that. It's okay for you to have doubts as long as you are motivated by those doubts to find the truth. Stop, look, and the last one, listen. Listen to the good news of Christmas. Don't be afraid of Christmas, but listen to the good news. Luke 2 verses 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. It is good news. 
What is the good news? The good news is that God became man. God became one of us. Jesus Christ came to the earth. Why? Well, in John 10, verse 10, it says, Jesus speaking, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus Christ wants you to have an abundant life on this earth. He promises us, promises us heaven if we will submit to him, but he also promises us that we will have a great life here on this earth, an abundant life, a good life. That's why he came, one of the reasons. Most people in this world are just existing. They don't really have life. Lose your, you, you will lose your fear when you understand what Jesus came to do. John 3 verse 17. Most of us know John 3 16. What about 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He didn't come to save uh, to scare us. He came to save us. Why do you suppose he came as a baby? Who's afraid of a baby? He came as a baby so that we could, we could see him and not be afraid of him. Uh, I grew up as a child having uh, preachers tell me that God is just absolutely waiting to zap me into hell should I make any wrong move. And I was terrified. I was terrified of God. I remember laying in my bed at night as a little boy, five, six years old, thinking about, oh, I hope God doesn't get me while I'm asleep tonight. Because this is what I was taught. But God says, I came as a baby to show you how kind and gentle and merciful I am. And so we can come to him in joy and excitement, not in fear and trembling. So he came to save us. The song goes, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What, cause, what might cause you to miss Christmas this year? Could it be your busyness? Could it be you're indifferent to it? Could it be that you're afraid of it? Well, for a new life at Christmas, stop. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins, that is, stop sinning, and live for righteousness. Look, Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And then listen, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. Folks, God wants you to be saved. God desires you to live with him in heaven forever. He loves you. He wants you there forever. And he laid out a simple plan in his New Testament for us to be able to do that. He said, all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and turn your life over to Him. Make Him the Lord of your life. You've got to repent of an old way of life and that's what giving your life to Jesus is all about. Saying, I'm going to stop living the way I used to live. I'm going to start living the best I can for Jesus. And then you have to be willing to confess that this is the case. That I am a follower. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And I confess that He is my Lord and my Savior. And then you have to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. This is what the Bible says. Acts 2.38, Acts 22, many places. 1 Peter 3.21 That baptism is a part of the salvation plan. To be immersed in water, not sprinkled, not somebody else making the choice for you, but you making the choice to be in Christ. You do those things, and you are assured of heaven. You are assured of a, an abundant life on this planet, in this life. You don't have to wait till the end of your life to receive the benefits. You get it now. This is what God has promised you and what he has promised me. And so if you haven't taken advantage of that, if you haven't done that yet, we're not going to have an invitation song. But I want you to know that I always stand ready 
to discuss this with you, to answer your questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask hard questions. You may have a hard question that I might not be able to answer, but I'm going to tell you, uh, I'll find the answer. I know the answer's there, and I know if we study it out enough, we can find it together. So don't be afraid to ask me any question that you have, and I'll be glad to help you find the answer through God's Word. And again, take a Bible if you need it today. It's going to be the last thing I say to you because I want everybody to have a Bible. You need that in your life. Would you stand with me, please? And let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you uh, for everyone here today. Thank you for our visitors. Uh, I pray that they, uh, that they received a blessing today. I pray that uh, uh, they enjoyed the children. I know I receive a blessing from them and from our visitors and from our members alike. Thank you for this church and for their dedication to Jesus. Thank you for their zeal in, in uh, feeding people each month. We thank you, Father, for the tremendous ways that you bless us. Help us to stop making other things more important. Help us, Father, uh, to look for you in everything in our lives and help us to listen to the good news and make application in our lives. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.